Insected Dethrone the Mantis Written and narrated by Kentaro Smith Chapter 1 Insected Sixteen years ago, life in the Arrow Kingdom was radically different from what it became under the Bastion Empire. That was what Hannah had been told her whole life, at least. Her caretaker, Elizabeth, would spend any free time at the orphanage reminiscing about everyday life was like in the Arrow Kingdom. Having barely been born when the Arrow Kingdom was rocked by the One Day War, all Hannah could do was take Elizabeth's word for it. Most of the other children never took interest in the 32-year-old woman's stories, wanting to hear more about the war itself over her former life. Hannah always took time to listen, though, because it was the few spare hours of the day where Elizabeth stopped being the head of the orphanage and became a normal person. Instead of schooling the children or working to keep the orphanage running, Elizabeth would become a relaxed woman who openly shared her dreams and smiled at innocent memories. Hannah liked talking with Elizabeth of the Arrow Kingdom, but she also worked to become as respectful as Elizabeth of the Winged Orphanage. Elizabeth was a role model, a mother, and a best friend. This made Elizabeth's sudden decline in health cause Hannah to panic. After 16 years of living with Elizabeth, Hannah couldn't imagine a life without her. Things only worsened when the young girl found out that the orphanage wasn't given enough money to cover medical emergencies such as this one. The financial support the building got was only just enough to keep the two hands employed and feed all 15 children. Having just turned 17, Hannah decided to take a gamble and see if she could get a job to support the orphanage. Having lived in the market district of the Empire her whole life, Hannah was acutely aware of how desperate each business was to hire and maintain employees to keep up with the rising influx of clients from neighboring kingdoms. Despite their typical desperation, though, nearly every business turned her down for being too young and homeschooled. The last business she visited, a small coffee shop, was the only place left to try. Luckily, she was hired to serve as a barista for this coffee shop under the condition that she worked at least 20 hours a week. Desperate for the funds to secure medical care for Elizabeth, Hannah agreed. It wasn't until the shop closed on her first day that she realized how fortunate she was in this situation. Not only did she secure a part-time job that expected more hours, but it was at a simple business only three blocks away from the orphanage. A 20-minute walk to a job where you prepare drinks for as few as four hours a day was much better than the smithing jobs the Empire was growing famous for. By the end of the first week, Hannah felt her excitement welling up inside her. Her first paycheck was to be given to her by the end of the shift, and she'll have put in 25 hours when she clocked out. Today will change everything, Hannah thought to herself. This first paycheck will afford us a checkup at the real doctor. In two weeks, I'll be able to afford most of the medicine sold at the pharmacy. Then, when she gets better, I'll... Hannah's body stiffened up as she tripped over her incomplete thought. Then I'll what? The thought had her mind navigating the dark rabbit hole that was her future. In less than a year, she would turn 18. At 18 years old, she would no longer be covered by the Empire's grant, and would be expected to leave to start a life of her own. She'd need to change to a full-time job, secure a new home, make a new family, maybe even serve as a soldier for the Bastion Empire. But how would she do all of that? Even comprehending life without Elizabeth had her march all over the Market District for a week straight job hunting. Could she even live alone? Before the rabbit hole could completely swallow Hannah, a door opened behind her, causing her heart to leap into her throat as she turned around. Her boss had simply stepped out from the kitchen door, his lifeless eyes tracing the front lobby like an exhausted painter. How are things? William asked, his voice tired and low. Not too busy, Hannah reported earnestly. She used her emerald eyes to point to the dining area on the other side of the counter. We've got five guests sitting in and have had eight guests take coffee out in the last hour. William nodded, his blank expression revealing nothing about his thoughts. Good. We'll be closing the shop an hour early today. After you take care of your cleanup duties, please see me in the back. Hannah frowned. Why are we closing early? Is something wrong? It's nothing to be concerned about. Just got some personal things to catch up on. 
The monotone delivery paired with William's neutral expression left Hannah nothing to dissect. William was a strange individual. The tall and slender man moved as if an invisible puppeteer steered his every movement. His face was perpetually covered in a dotted forest of facial hair, and the top of his head was a frozen tidal wave of thick oil that threatened to obscure his shoulders. To say the man appeared to be sickly and disorganized would be a charitable description of him. Despite this appearance, the coffee shop, strangely named Flower Cafe, was well kept and stocked at the start of every shift. The man showed no emotion, but his actions were an essay about his love for the shop. You should also try to get some proper sleep tonight, William continued. We both deserve a quiet weekend after this week. You're going to sleep? Hannah asked in disbelief. All weekend? William's long, quiet yawn said more than any response he could have made. I'm going to count our inventory now. If you need me, I'm just behind the kitchen. Yes, sir. Being the princess for someone else's empire described Julius' youth in both the glamour and awkwardness that entailed. The former princess of the Arrow Kingdom was at the heart of one of the bloodiest battles of the One Day War, and, in that moment, figured her life as royalty would end in a child's casket. Instead, the new king, King Russell, married her mother, Queen Clarice, and allowed the two of them to maintain their positions in the new empire. Julia even earned the duties expected of her role when she turned 16 several years later. Two years after the war, her younger brother, Prince Isaac, would be born. Despite the horrible circumstances they met under, Julia's relationship with King Russell was fairly respectful. Julia treated him less like a father and more like a manager, making her role in his empire strictly professional. In turn, King Russell treated her like a high-level lead, never interfering with her personal life and only speaking with her during working hours. While Julia was never given the original purpose for the One Day War, she never held this against the new king. The war was a tragedy that all parties wanted to move on from, including Julia herself. Using it as a grudge would not only be petty, but make her seem unfit for the future role as queen. Despite what many had speculated upon Prince Isaac's birth, King Russell had made it clear that Julia would be next in line for the throne. He even told her that she wouldn't need to marry to take on the role, should she deem it unnecessary. While she wasn't against a marriage, she certainly wouldn't allow herself to be tangled in a political one, especially since her heart had already been stolen. A set of four rhythmic knocks played through Julia's bedroom door. Your Majesty, night is Catherine reporting in. Come in, Julia called. The door opened and a woman stepped in. This woman was the personal bodyguard of the princess, appointed and knighted by Julia herself. She had ash-blonde hair that haphazardly cut to finger length. Her bangs pushed aside to allow her focused blue eyes to shine above her other traits. Her body was covered from the neck down in chainmail suit that occasionally peeked through the spaces of her curved iron armor. With a single arm, she held a rounded helmet at her hip, the prison bar visor hiding the face of an invisible Dullahan. The knightess, like Julia, was at the worst of the one-day war. Instead of being a helpless victim, though, Catherine took up a sword and fought in the battle. The heroic courage on display was enough for Julia to recruit the, at the time, 15-year-old girl as her personal bodyguard. Over the course of three years, Catherine was put through brutal training under King Russell's own bodyguard. The physical training, along with the strict instruction, transformed the skinny teenager into a six-foot-tall Amazonian warrior. Good morning, Kathy, Julia greeted. She turned away from the makeup table but remained in her white chair. Good morning, your highness, Catherine greeted as she closed the door behind her. After a brief moment of silence, Julia's cheeks inflated and her eyes frowned. Well? The knightess's expression remained neutral, but her shoulders whispered her embarrassment. Do we really still need to do this? Julia spread her arms out toward Catherine. Come. Catherine didn't move at first, but it didn't take long for her to step up to the princess and wrap her in an awkward hug. The years Catherine and Julia had spent together since the One Day War forged an awkward friendship between the two. At first, the two maintained a certain emotional distance that allowed the other to be as comfortable as one could be in a castle full of strangers. This all changed when Julia's night terror started robbing the princess entire night's worth of sleep. 
Catherine volunteered to temporarily share the princess's quarters until her night terrors were gone. That living scenario allowed the two women to open up to each other more frequently, sharing in their fears and celebrating each other's achievements. Their rooms have long since been separated, but Julia never relinquished the warmth of that relationship, even when Catherine did her best to resume the distant yet respectful relationship they originally had. Even alone, this is embarrassing, Catherine admitted quietly. Julia's lips curved into a mischievous smile. If you married me, it'd be totally normal, even in public. The knightess gently pushed herself away and took a step back. Please stop telling those jokes. You know that'd be a conflict of interest for the Empire. Then let me hire a replacement so I can marry you. A sigh as heavy as a longsword escaped Catherine's lips. Have you finished preparing, your highness? Julia nodded as she bounced to her feet. I'm always ready for you. If that's the case, then please lead the way. Your brother will be joining us at the dining table today. Julia's whimsical smile lost some of its glow. Isaac. I haven't had breakfast with him for a few months now. I wonder what brought this on. Catherine opened the bedroom door and motioned into the hallway. I'll share what he told me as we walk. Can I hold your hand as we walk? No, your highness. Pretty please? No. I'll give you a kiss. No. Julia's cheeks inflated once more. Boo. As the two walked down the castle's hallways, they politely greeted the maids and butlers who were tending to their duties. While it was true some were from the original Arrow Kingdom, the vast majority of the castle's staff were from the Bastion Empire's army. Their faces, along with the red and black color schemes of the decor, served as daily reminders that Julia's home was conquered and violated. It was ultimately a choice for her to remain in the castle, but she always reflected on how much softer home felt when it was bathed in blues and whites. Catherine never got the opportunity to see the castle's interior before the Bastion Empire's blood and darkness stained nearly every surface. Before the invasion, she was just another teenage peasant living in the kingdom's art district. Julia wasn't sure what Catherine's family did for a living back then, but ever since the art district was converted to the training district, the knightess had no interest in divulging her old life. Prince Isaac met with me earlier requesting you join him for breakfast, Catherine said as she waved to a fellow guardsman. He wanted to have a discussion concerning the recent disappearances. At the mention of the topic, Julia's expression soured. This won't be a pleasant discussion then, Catherine nodded. Have you read up on the three disappearances? There's a third this month. Yes. I know you haven't actually been reading those files thoroughly, but the details of the last three disappearances are different from the previous ones. If my little brother wants to talk about it, then he probably read up on something that could help us from the library. Hopefully the food will stay down while we talk. The two opened the door to the castle's private dining room. It was a wide room with a low ceiling, illuminated with the soft glow of the morning sun through blocky windows. In the center of the room was a dining table made of bright chocolate wood, with matching chairs waiting to seat eight people. In one of those chairs was Prince Isaac, offering a patient smile with his hands resting on the table. Julia saw her mother's ocean blue eyes peering through her stepfather's thick charcoal hair, whose bangs threatened to lick Isaac's pointed nose. Unlike Julia, who wore a frilly dress in the traditional sky blues and whites of the Arrow Kingdom, Isaac wore a tight suit with the blood and oil highlighting his thin features. The man standing behind Isaac was the prince's personal bodyguard, Knight Trevor. King Russell assigned the man to protect Isaac, but since Isaac rarely left the library, the knight had become nothing more than a weaponized monitor for the 14-year-old boy. The disappointing description was something Trevor was aware of, evident by the eternal scowl he wore when his black hair wasn't obscured under the sharp pointed helmet under his arm. Knight Trevor, Catherine greeted, offering a salute in a fluid motion. Knight is Catherine, Trevor greeted returning the salute with snappy precision. Little brother? Julia greeted as she took her seat. Big sister, Isaac greeted. It's been a few weeks since we last spoke. How are things? Things haven't changed much, Julia said with a relieved sigh. I did finish submitting the proposal for increasing the Civil Guard's forces, but otherwise there is as much work to be done as there are stars in the sky. Isaac let out a chuckle that Julia recognized as strained rather than natural. I envy you, big sister. 
Since I'm not old enough to take on my duties, all I can do is study under my tutor, train under Trevor, and study in the library. What I do to actually contribute to our father's empire. Speaking of your father, Julia said with a forced smile. He brought up how much you study. While I take no issue with your educational pursuits, it seems your father would like to see you hold your sword more often. Isaac let out a heavy sigh. Is that why you wear your helmet when you walk around the castle, Trevor? To hide from my father? N no, Trevor stuttered as his eyes rapidly scanned for any eavesdroppers. As a Boston soldier, I was, uh, taught to always be prepared for combat, even when I should feel safe. You've no need to feel ashamed of the prince, Catherine said. As knights, we are... Quiet, you, Trevor snapped. We bastions have our pride. Do not speak ill of our prince. Julia jumped up from her seat, but Catherine's hands quickly pushed her back down. Forgive my speech, the knightess said with a bow of her head. I was intending to offer praise for your ability to train Isaac since he was barely able to walk. Your training may be minimum expected for his highness, but I'm confident your instruction has put him above any who dare defy him. Kathy could still- Julia started before a gloved hand covered her mouth. My princess is correct in the assumption that I would offer my tutorage should the young master request for it, Catherine continued. I'd also appreciate a chance to spar with you sometime, Night Trevor. Julia felt her blood boiling over even as Catherine covered her mouth. The amount of tar the princess wanted to spew would be enough to coat her spotless reputation in an ugly color with no hope of recovery. As entertaining as this discussion has been, Isaac said, I would like to drop the formalities and get to the main topic at hand. Julia pushed Catherine's hands over her head, pushing her fiery rage down at the same time. The disappearances, right? Isaac turned to Catherine and offered her a deep nod. Thank you for informing my sister. I stopped at the mention of the last victim, Catherine said as she returned to a refined stance. I assumed you wanted to present the fruits of your labor. Julia mentioned you were from the art district, but I think that was the most flavorful thing you've said to me. He turned his head to Trevor. You can learn to talk like that from books, you know. Little brother, Julia said sternly. This is an important matter, correct? Yes. The prince reached down beside his chair and retrieved a leather messenger bag and set it on the table. I'm sure you're aware of the details of these recent disappearances, but I'll be giving you the files just as a refresher. The princess was very familiar with the disappearances. The case as a whole had been slowly becoming more concerning as time went on. The disappearances originally started ten years prior, targeting people in the Empire's colleges. It didn't matter their age, gender, what district they were from, not even the institutes they attended. In the first year alone, thirteen people went missing only for their bodies to be discovered a month or two later, the cause of death being suffocation after being injected with a mysterious toxin. This led many to assume a serial killer was on the loose. The second year furthered the assumption as bodies turned up as quickly as two weeks later this time with lacerations freeing blood from within. For years, blood loss was the leading cause of death for each and every victim. In the last year, though, there was a startling shift in the pattern. The targets were no longer limited to colleges. As the files for the three most recent victims were handed to Julia by Trevor, the princess's eyes glided down the reports like a winter sled. In each case, the victim's body was found in a secluded area with shattered pieces of stone surrounding them. The body showed no signs of damage or stress, but attempts at resuscitation were found to be futile. The cause of death had yet to be discerned. The stone pieces, when reassembled, formed a statue that could only be described as a humanoid insect in armor. The theory was that a new killer was using art to protest Bastion Empire's focus on combat training rather than the Arrow Kingdom's artistic focus. The first victim had a centipede head. The second victim, a fly's head. The most recent victim was a cockroach. This resulted in the victims surrounding the recent disappearances to be nicknamed Insecteds. Are you familiar with an old Arrow Kingdom play titled Critters in the Eyes of the Gods? Isaac asked as Julia finished reviewing the case files. I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it, Julia responded, her eyes glued to the reports. It was a popular play, Catherine said her voice picking up a bit of energy. The art district even made detailed costumes for each of the characters. Isaac nodded. So I've read. 
The story follows a group of insects as they travel the world. They encounter larger creatures and have their numbers whittled as they travel. First is a spider, then a chicken, and finally a flock of unknown birds. What does this have to do with the case? Julia asked, finally lifting her nose from the page. At one point in the play, the insects kill a human man. At that moment, the insects celebrate, claiming they killed the rulers of the earth. They even discuss in great detail how they would kill a royal family and overthrow a kingdom. You think our perpetrator wants to overthrow the Bastion Empire? Julia guessed. No, I think our perpetrators want to kill the Bastion populace. Julia frowned. What makes you think there's more than one perpetrator? These recent statues are extremely detailed and well sculpted. You think a single artist can make three statues in a month? One person cannot possibly have the skills to abduct people and then release them to the public without being detected. I think we have an organization here. Julia wasn't a detective. Had she not held the title of princess, she could charitably be described as a politician and secondary advisor to the king. What Isaac said made sense, but she wasn't sure where he was going with this explanation, or even where he picked up on these details. Okay, she said, dismissing her inadequate understanding of Isaac's theory. Then why bring up the play? And what do you mean the bastion populace? The young man pointed to his head. Before last year, the victims were limited to a random college students. When this changed, the targets weren't as random as many had assumed. While the people abducted had no connective tissue on the surface, they all had black hair and brown eyes, traits only shared by full or half-blood bastion citizens. Julia stopped. It was something she hadn't really put much thought into while reviewing the case files. Arrow Kingdom citizens often had blonde hair with a mix of blue or green eyes. There were the rare brown-haired members, but even they stood out more at a glance than the average citizen of the Bastion Empire. Why are you telling me this? Julia asked, despite knowing what her brother would say. Isaac's response was delivered with a sad smile. It seems the Arrow Kingdom has not truly died, big sister. Should a violent uprising occur, it could be less than a few years before Blues and Whites return to the castle. I didn't want this, Isaac. Julia's chair crashed into the ground as she shot up to her feet. I don't hate the Bastion people. They're as much family as you are. Isaac's eyes drifted down to the table. I'm not accusing you, big sister. I just wanted to tell you in case something happens. Something happens. The princess's eyes grew larger than dinner plates as she shouted before her brother could elaborate. Stop! Julia's body enveloped the young boy in a fierce hug. As the prince was regaining his senses from the surprise, his sister's voice spoke in a shaky hush. Don't talk like you're going to die. The Bastion people are family. Your family. That means I'll protect you. Protect them. I'll protect everyone. Isaac took a moment to appreciate his sister's display of affection before asking in an anxious voice. How? Julia pulled her head back to meet his gaze and put on a confident smile. You might be tired of hearing this, but I've got the best bodyguard in the kingdom. That means, under her training, we make the best fighters in the Empire. And I'll prove it. Hannah's shift that day was dragging on from one eventful customer interaction to the next. Since the influx of customers was also starting to slow as the shop neared its last two hours, she couldn't help but wonder if time was playing a cruel prank on her. Well, it is just my first week, Hannah thought to herself. Maybe the exhaustion's getting to me. Once the final hour ran its course, Hannah took 20 minutes to lock the doors and clean the shop before stepping into the kitchen. William was leaning against one of the counters with a clipboard in his hands. Unlike during their earlier conversation, his eyes were alive and focused. As far as Hannah could tell, the only time William had more than a zombie-like personality was when he was caring for the shop. It seemed to be the only thing he cared for. Even when Hannah made mistakes with customers, he would talk as if being angry would be too much of a bother. It was to the point where Hannah wondered if he was just extremely patient or genuinely only cared that his shop was operating smoothly. William, as a person, was rather unremarkable outside of his undead personality. His black hair lazily draped over his thin shoulders, and his tall frame was nearly as thin as the clipboard in his hands, making his slender limbs more akin to broom handles. Even his uniform of a loose black button-up shirt and brown apron 
couldn't hide his frail body. Hannah wondered if William was ever considered for the Bastion Kingdom's draft lottery since he would likely fail the annual fitness check-in. Failing those typically resulted in mandatory combat training with the Civil Guards for a month. Mr. William, Hannah called gently, everything front has been taken care of. The man's eyes quickly lost their light as he turned to face her. Thank you, he said plainly. He reached down into his apron and retrieved a cheap yellow envelope. Here. This is your pay for the week. Hannah gently took the envelope and felt relief wash over her body. Finally, her mind cheered. Since the shop closed up early, I can go grocery shopping before I go home. That'll also give me time to plan out the meals for the week. One more thing, Hannah. The young girl returned her attention to her boss and was startled to see a fire in his eyes that burned with... something. She wasn't exactly sure what it was, but it seemed what he was about to say was important. Be careful on your way home. Hannah had heard of the recent disappearances from Elizabeth. Some of the children at the orphanage had nightmares from the rumors about who were the targets of these disappearances. I'm just going to the pharmacy, then I'll go home, Hannah promised. It's not too far from the orphanage. William's expression shifted like water at the mention of the orphanage. Orphanage. Hannah felt uneasiness from the man. Her body shifted, visibly revealing her sudden anxiety as she spoke. E yeah, I live at the local orphanage. Hannah started speaking more quickly as her nervousness started shaking her body. The grants cover for the cost of the building and some food, but when Miss Elizabeth got sick, the grants couldn't cover her medical expenses, which is why I took this job. We haven't taken her to a doctor yet, but I- Hannah. William's somber tone quickly silenced Hannah's rambling. Is it really that bad? The young girl lowered her head. She couldn't meet his focused gaze. She hadn't seen this much emotion out of him before. With all this being directed at her, Hannah wondered if she was about to lose her job over such a simple conversation. Yes, she whispered. There was a moment of silence that brought down the weight of a cart. Her greatest fears were about to become reality over the state of her home. William would cast her out from the only place that would hire her. Miss Elizabeth would never get the help she needed. Hannah would have to search outside the district for another chance at work. And the other caretakers would need to... A hand gently pressed down on Hannah's shoulders, startling her enough to raise her head. William was looking at her with kind eyes and a soft smile. Tomorrow morning... Come back to the shop around 8 o'clock. I'll go with you to get a doctor to visit the orphanage. After that, I'd like to meet this Miss Elizabeth. You're going to help me? Hannah asked, her bewilderment apparent. The Empire isn't easy to live in, William said as he removed his hand. That doesn't mean I can't help to change that. T tomorrow morning, you said? Yes. 8 o'clock. Hannah lifted her head, holding back tears of joy as she expressed her gratitude. Thank you, Mr. William. You don't know how much I appreciate this. William nodded, and his expression slowly returned to the blank slate he typically had. Head straight home. Again, be careful out there. Hannah nodded and exited the shop. The sheer joy in her body, paired with overwhelming relief, spurred her into an excited sprint down the wide streets of the market district. Her mind raced with positive thoughts and plans for saving her orphanage as her feet slammed against the stone walkway. I'll keep this a secret for now. That way when I get back to the orphanage, the other caretakers won't have to worry about Miss Elizabeth. Then the doctor can take care of her, I can keep working at the coffee shop and use the money to get new clothes for the kids. Maybe I can get something nice for myself. Or maybe a new book. Then once everything goes back to normal, I can... Hannah's pace slowed to a halt at the corner before her orphanage. I can do what? I'll be 18 soon. I won't be able to stay at the orphanage for much longer. Miss Elizabeth didn't let the older kids stay either. She wouldn't even let them work for her. W what will I do? Just as these thoughts threatened to consume her, Hannah picked up on a strange scent in the air. It was thick and repulsive, 
irritating both her nose and eyes. It reminded Hannah of failed dishes she attempted to cook, and the dry wooden stairs leading to the orphanage's basement. It only took another moment for her to realize what she was smelling, and a chill went down her spine. She took a step around the corner and confirmed her nightmare. The single-story orphanage at the end of the road was glowing with a brilliant orange glow. The wooden structure emitted sounds of decay and collapse as the flames ate away at its form. A small crowd of local neighbors were standing outside, frozen in awe and confusion. Their hesitation pushed Hannah to move. I have to save them. I have to save Miss Elizabeth, the children. These thoughts looped it through her head as she sprinted past the onlookers toward the orphanage. Her thoughts pushed out the world. Sounds couldn't interrupt her. The dancing lights of the fire couldn't distract her. Nothing could stop her from saving the only family she knew. But that momentum was brought to a sudden halt when her hands pulled open the door to the children's shared bedroom. The scalding heat of the doorknob was a preamble for the tidal wave of flames that washed over Hannah's body when the door swung open. In the blink of an eye, the clothes on her body caught fire, sending her into a panic that had her stumble to the ground, desperate to roll out the flames. As she did, she started to notice a strange silhouette in the room she had planned to enter. Once her focus wasn't required on herself, she squinted her eyes. While she didn't recognize the standing individual, she did start to recognize the shapes lying at their feet. The pile was burned beyond faithful appearances, but Hannah's heart knew what she was seeing. The children couldn't be saved, and it appeared to be due to the mysterious figure's hands. <laughs> who, who are you? Hannah coughed her words up through the thick smoke, her soul raging and her body screaming in pain. What did you do? The figure turned toward her. It was at that moment that the young girl realized she wasn't talking to a human. The most immediately startling detail about the figure was the eyes. Large, bulging eyes glowed a deep crimson through the hot, distorted air. Black antennae sprouted from the sides of the figure's head, with a matching horn protruding from the forehead. The only thing human about the head was the nose, lips, and chin sticking out from beneath the insect-like eyes. Beneath the head was what appeared to be a red and black wedding dress. The upper torso was draped in a vibrant red with black spots, while the lower half was an eternal darkness that hid the figure's legs. Red gloves crawled up the figure's elbows from their sharpened fingertips. This wasn't human. It was a monster and it killed everyone Hannah had grown to love. Who are you? Hannah repeated, her words more strained than before. What did you do? The monster wordlessly walked to Hannah, ignoring the storm of flames that danced around its body. Before the young girl could get up to flee, the monster's gloved fingers clamped down on her throat and lifted her into the air. From a distance, the monster didn't appear to be that big. But now that Hannah was face to face with it, she realized that it towered over most of the population in the district. Even being held at eye level with this creature, Hannah's legs flailed aimlessly several inches over the ground. After being held for several seconds, the monster tossed Hannah back down the hallway. Pain from the impact stunned the young girl just long enough for the flames to look at her exposed limbs for several seconds. Once Hannah regained her senses, she pushed herself away from the nearest flames and faced the beast. Where is he? The monster's voice was slow and strained, almost as if it struggled to speak at all despite the ease at which it threw Hannah. Hannah attempted to respond through pained coughs and wheezes. <coughs> Who insected? Champion must kill. The world was beginning to spin and feel distant as Hannah breathed in more of the fumes. She turned toward the exit and started to crawl, only for a set of fingers to grab at her ankle. Where is Mantis? He is near. I don't know. Hannah heard a sickening snap before she was hurled to the front door of the orphanage. 
When she hit the ground, her hips were struck against the property's wooden fencing, causing her to scream through pained and terrified gasps. Voices behind her were also being raised in alarm, but Hannah couldn't hear them. The pain wrecking her body and the air fighting to fill her lungs absorbed all of her attention. When her vision started to focus, she saw the insect monster stepping out of the orphanage. Eyes locked onto her. Where is Mantis? The monster's mouth appeared to ask. Hannah wanted to talk, but she could barely breathe, let alone put her thoughts together for a response. The monster, seemingly realizing this, walked directly towards Hannah, its mouth opening wider with each step. From within its jaws, Hannah saw an ember glowing in the back of its throat. It was growing brighter, quickly becoming a ball of fire ready to explode. Several neighbors appeared in Hannah's vision. Two of them spread their bodies out in front of the beast, clearly attempting to block it. One of them leaned down in front of Hannah and started examining her wounds. This neighbor was also trying to say something, but the young girl still couldn't hear what the man was saying. Run! Please! Save yourself! Hannah's desperate thoughts didn't manifest into audible words. Her lungs were struggling enough with gathering the oxygen she needed to survive, let alone form coherent words. She watched in horror as the fire building in the monster's mouth launched forward, striking her two defenders and instantly setting their bodies aflame. As they collapsed to the ground, the monster moved closer. The man attempting to help Hannah turned and took up a defensive stance, but was immediately dealt with when the monster's hand pierced through his chest. Hannah wheezed out a terrified screech, which added more strain on her lungs on top of the existing pain racking her body. The monster wrapped its bloody fingers around her chin and hoisted her off the ground once more. Scent of Mantis here, the monster's voice faintly communicated. Where is Insected Champion? When Hannah didn't answer immediately, the fingers on her chin slipped down to her throat and squeezed. Where is he? Hannah's mind began to race, searching for a way out or the answer to the monster's question. The monster's grip was tightening with each second she didn't respond. Her throat was sore, her muscles ached, and she had no idea what an insected was. Was it a monster like this one? Was an insected some kind of name for someone? Why were they a champion? Unfortunately, this young girl couldn't find a solution to either issue. As her eyes rolled into the back of her head, Hannah wondered if Elizabeth was safe, and if William would be disappointed in her sudden absence the next day. A deafening explosion sounded off in front of Hannah, followed by another sudden influx of oxygen. As she gasped and attempted to focus her vision on the world, she quickly realized that she wasn't being held by a deadly hand on her throat anymore. Instead, a pair of thick, metal arms supported her thighs and head. Despite the comfortable position, what she saw kept her heart pounding in her ears. The head of a praying mantis crossed with a knight's helmet looked off into the distance, complete with the terrifying green eyes protruding on either side. A black undersuit hid beneath a dark green breastplate with insect legs serving as ribs. Briefly distracting Hannah from this new monster was the voice of the red insect monster. Mantis is here! Hannah turned to the source and saw that the fire monster was sitting against the wall of the orphanage, the wall behind her suffering impact damage. Did this mantis monster launch the fire monster into the wall? Hannah wondered. Are you alright? A deep voice asked from beneath the mantis mask. Hannah opened her mouth to respond, but was interrupted by a flurry of coughs and wheezes. The mantis set Hannah down against the orphanage's fencing and faced her. It was then that she noticed a black glass visor that connected the two praying mantis eyes. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, the mantis instructed calmly. As slowly as you can until you can breathe normally. Hannah nodded and started doing as she was told, though her breaths were still shallow and rapid. Keep going. I'll keep you safe. 
Insected. Champion. The red insect was standing now, pointing a gloved finger in the mantis's direction. I will kill you. The mantis stood and faced the monster. I don't like fighting. The masculine voice of the mantis slipped a drip of anger in his tone. His fingers balled into fists, and two green blades flipped out from his forearms. But if I'm going to stop you, I'll fight. What Hannah watched for the next three minutes was a violent battle between the wild and unpredictable attacks of the red monster and the calm, precise strikes and parries of the mantis. The fight was extremely one-sided. For every desperate swing from the red insect, the mantis retaliated with three slashes and thrusts of his blade. When the firebug targeted low, the mantis would reward the effort with powerful kicks that knocked her back. Nearing the end of the battle, the red monster dropped to one knee and let out a frustrated hiss. Champion! I must become champion! The mantis crossed his arms in front of his face, keeping his palms facing out to his sides. As he spoke, his voice showed no signs of exhaustion or anger. I can't promise you'll live to see tomorrow, but I promise to make tomorrow better for someone else. The blades on the mantis's forearm suddenly wrapped themselves in a soft neon glow. The large mantis eyes shared that glow as he lowered his stance and spread his arms. After a still moment, the mantis leapt forward and vanished upon contact with the red monster. The feminine creature let out a bone-chilling scream as her head was violently thrown back. Her arms curled into her body and her hands shrunk into white knuckle fists. After several seconds of tortured screams, the mantis materialized behind the red monster from a large green glow, his arms now crossed in front of his chest. Shortly afterwards, the red monster was quickly petrified in stone the human mouth remaining open to continue screaming in silence. What is happening? Hannah managed. The mantis turned his head toward the young girl. The civil guards will be here shortly. Just stay put. Without waiting for a response, the mantis ran behind one of the neighboring houses and disappeared for the rest of the night. Just as Hannah was starting to process everything that had happened, she noticed the stone statue starting to crack. Her controlled breathing quickly devolved into panicked gasps as she recalled the red insect's threatening power. The mantis was gone, and Hannah still couldn't move. There was nothing to protect her. She watched in horror as the statue's outer surface crumbled and nearly fainted when she saw the body that slipped out onto the floor. An unconscious Elizabeth laid still in the charred grass.